Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar on urban heat islands. This is part of the Woods Institute's ongoing environment and energy panel series of policy-focused briefings that explore the intersection of environmental and energy concerns. Before addressing the main topic, I want to start with acknowledging the indigenous people on whose ancestral land those of us at Stanford are occupying today. Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Mwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. For today's webinar on building for heat resilience in urban areas, I'm thrilled to be joined by Marta Segura, Diane Grunick, Ann Gary, and Sean Weefon. I'm Chris Field, Director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. The Woods Institute has been, for nearly 20 years, Stanford's marquee investment in advancing understanding and developing practical, just solutions to our era's pressing environmental problems. Woods Scholars team with other researchers, governments, companies, and NGOs to build bridges from research to action to address challenges in climate, health, food, water, oceans, and biodiversity. We're excited to be a founding pillar in the bold new Stanford Door School of Sustainability, officially launched on September 1 of last year. Today's session is part of our continuing exploration of climate-related extreme events. After today, the next Woods Institute webinar will be on permitting electricity. It's on November 14th. Please check the Woods website for information on upcoming events related to climate and sustainability. You know, we all know that 2023 has been hot, really hot. July was the hottest month in the instrumental record by a whopping two-tenths of a centigrade degree over the same month in 2019. In June, Death Valley reached 128 Fahrenheit. As eye-popping as these temperatures are, it's super important to understand that the data from typical rural weather stations are poor descriptors of the climate in urban areas. Based on their strong absorption of incoming solar radiation by concrete and asphalt, local heat generation, and often limited evaporative cooling, cities tend to be substantially warmer than rural areas. The effect is typically in the range of 1 to 7 Fahrenheit, but it can be as much as 15 to 20 Fahrenheit. This kind of added warming can transform a site from warm to potentially deadly. Urban heat islands are a major problem, but there are also many ways to moderate their effects. For a perspective on understanding urban heat islands and what we can do about them, I'm excited to be joined today by four distinguished experts. Marta Segura serves as both the Chief Heat Officer and Director of Climate Emergency Mobilization for the City of Los Angeles. She's one of 10 Chief Heat Officers worldwide. Marta is a thought leader on extreme heat, environmental justice, climate, public health, and stakeholder engagement. She has extensive experience in engaging public, philanthropic, private, institutional, and nonprofit sectors to design, implement, and drive equitable climate policy. In her work with the City of Los Angeles, Marta is spearheading internal and external strategic partnerships for the development of a climate vulnerability assessment, a heat action plan, and a local hazard mitigation plan, and a climate action plan. Across these efforts, she prioritizes climate equity and community engagement. Diane Grunick is an internationally recognized energy and regulatory policy expert. Her expertise covers energy efficiency, demand response, smart grid, renewable energy resources, transmission, and climate change. Diane's a past president of the California League of Conservation Voters, and she served as a commissioner on the California Public Utilities Commission from 2005 to 2010, leading its efforts on energy efficiency, transmission planning and permitting, and Western energy issues. She's a member of the advisory board of the Global Cool Cities Alliance. Ann Gary oversees communication, capacity building, and convenings for the Natural Capital Project. She spearheads NatCap's sustainable livable cities efforts and co-leads its marine and coastal work. Anne's expertise is the relationship between people and nature. Her work combines cutting edge science and engagement. She uses software, art, poetry, and more. 
Before working for NatCap, she was a National Research Council Fellow at NOAA's Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. And finally, Sean Wee Fawn is the Joseph and Han Mai Goodman Professor in the School of Engineering at Stanford with a primary appointment in electrical engineering. His research interests are in nanophotonic structures and their applications in energy and information technologies. He's published hundreds of refereed journal articles and holds over 70 patents. Relevant to today's topic, Sean Wee's group has developed materials that use a combination of solar reflection and thermal emission to cool well below ambient temperatures, even in full sunlight. So the format for today's webinar is that we'll start with an opening comment from Marta. After that, I'll ask a few questions and kick off a discussion with all the panelists. At about 20 minutes before the hour, I'll turn the figurative microphone to all of you and pose questions from you uh, to the speakers. To get a question in the queue, please use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many questions as we can. And we'll provide written answers on the Woods website to the questions that we don't have time to address during the webinar. Marta, let me turn the stage to you to uh, fill us in about urban heat islands and how we should think about them, how we should respond. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to this um, broader audience in Northern California, being that we're in Los Angeles. And I guess I want to point out first that I think uh, probably all of California is experiencing unusual heat for this season. And um, it, it it makes this uh, panel even all the more relevant. And, and I just wanted to repeat that something that was said earlier that our heat seasons are longer. They're now from mid-June to mid-November. And even though we uh, want to have uh, summers longer, we don't want this kind of excessive extreme heat affecting the livability, walkability, and the habitability of our cities and areas across the nation and across California. Um, and urban heat islands, yes, they, they are something that are unique to cities because we've created too much concrete and too little tree canopy. Um, but what we're doing in Los Angeles and through the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office is um, expanding an equity-based model for the creation of heat resilient zones. So this considers health disparities, the gaps in climate infrastructure, um, particularly in the areas of greatest vulnerability and risk to extreme heat and other extreme weather and climate events. We need to do this while we expand meaningful community engagement and our heat relief campaign in Los Angeles and pushing for um, increased resilient centers, cooling centers and, and, and hubs so that we can also address not just the long-term climate adaptation and mitigation, but also the short-term emergency response and public safety needed in areas with little to no air conditioning in homes or work. So what I think that I'd like to talk about is how we create um, systems of accountability and how we create actionable goals, not just plans, um, and how cities can turn that corner to ensure that we are effective in the implementation of these amazing solutions, some of, some of which will be presented today. Um, I think I read an article, I'm sorry, I can't quote, but out of all of the climate action plans that exist in the state of California, I think less than 30% have been implemented. So it's really important to note that um, implementable, uh, implementable actions and strategies at cities, um, depending on the alignment of those plans and the structure of the city is super important to consider. So in LA, we have what's called the climate equity index. Um, sorry, in LA, we have an equity index. And what I would like to create from that equity index is a climate equity scorecard. That does include this health disparity data, climate infrastructure investments, the opportunities to apply for more IRA and federal funding, um, the, the success of our public awareness campaigns, not just through the emergency management department, but also through our office, the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office, because preparation and awareness is really one of the biggest um, efforts that we can 
make progress on because these heat alerts that come out maybe a day or two before are not enough for families to prepare to avoid um, heat emergencies of hospitalizations and, and premature deaths. We really need to shift the hearts and minds of how people think about heat and how people think about summers and ensure that they understand the increased dangers and the increased risks for heat. So in Los Angeles, we have a heat relief for LA campaign that's multilingual, um, culturally competent and been distributed with um, over a hundred organizations citywide through both one-on-one um, -on -one and social media. But even with the success of that campaign, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done with regards to public awareness. So basically, Los Angeles and other cities don't just need to reshape their city with improved infrastructure um, and climate adaptation and technologies, but we also need to reshape the way that we um, as Angelinos think about extreme heat and how we prepare for extreme heat as a disaster, as an emergency, and everything that we do before and after during the recovery is also critically important. So in, in addition to that, or, or because of that, uh, Los Angeles has created what's called the Cool Spots LA app. And it's an app that considers these health disparities um, that are cause related to extreme heat waves, but it also has plotted all of our cooling centers, our resilience centers, our hydration stations, basically all of our cooling amenities throughout the city of LA. We've also mapped our tree canopies and we're creating an equitable tree planting strategy. So in the old days, everybody would just say, we're gonna plant a million trees or we're gonna plant X number of trees. Well, in Los Angeles, We've learned our lesson and we understand that it's not just about the quantity, it's about the maintenance of those trees and the strategic planting of trees where they are most needed. Um, and I wanna say that from the research that I've done, um, the literature that I've reviewed, the way to accelerate climate change is by investing first and foremost in the historically disinvested areas of a city because we can make the greatest progress in not just in nature-based solutions and increasing tree canopy, but in reducing pollution, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and seeing the greatest um, improvements in health disparities. And it doesn't only have impacts in that particular micro region or microclimate, it has um, positive implications for reducing uh, climate impacts for the rest of the region and the rest of the city. And as mentioned earlier, we're developing probably one of the first heat action plans in the state of California. The state has not required it yet. The way that we're gonna make that implementable and actionable is by in integrating it into our local hazard mitigation plan, our sustainability plans, um, our, our parts of our general um, plan, but also our climate vulnerability assessment. Our climate vulnerability assessment will have recommendations citywide that are more granular than what's provided by the state of California. And in fact, we hope the data that we collect with this climate vulnerability assessment will inform the maps that the state creates, that the federal government creates, because I don't know about your cities, but in, in Los Angeles, the maps provided by the state and the federal government do not accurately reflect where we have our climate hazards in Los Angeles. And in order to get funding for those climate hazards, those maps have to accurately reflect where um, they can fund climate hazard mitigation and adaptation. So I think that what I'm basically trying to convey to all of you, it's really important to include communities and the public in the solutions of your heat mitigation and heat adaptation plans it's important to align your heat action plans with your climate action plans, your climate vulnerability assessments, your local hazard mitigation plans. And it's really important then to have an accountability tool. Ours is the equity index, but to ensure that there are equitable climate metrics that are aligned with health disparity data so that the outcome is not just reduced carbon reduction. The outcome is actually improved, healthy, thriving communities for all of the region. So it, it's it's about time that um, climate 
experts begin to really focus on the improvements that they're investing in as it as it impacts the population, as it impacts the health of of and of everyday residents of their cities, and in our case of all Angelinos. And in fact, I like to remind folks that in our charter, the reason that we exist is to protect and defend and improve the health and safety of all communities. So thank you so much for this opportunity, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Marta, and, and thank you also for laying out the, the two big threads for action in this space, the one thread of steps that decrease the extent of urban heat islands and use shade and other strategies to decrease those, and, and the other threat of being uh, prepared to deal with heat events as they occur and and have the capability to especially have the most vulnerable people um, informed, able to move to cooling centers and um, protected in all the different ways it can be mobilized. And I wonder if you want to speak from the sustainable, livable cities perspective that you take, how you think about the integration of these two components is the is is the main component that you think about how to decrease urban heat island effects, or do you see this engagement and physical structure working hand in hand? Definitely working hand in hand. Uh, I think that we've we've learned from the past where we um identify as experts what kind of infrastructure we need and where we need it. And it's not been as successful as we had hoped. So for example, for a very long time, cities have been in integrating EV charging stations. Well, they went to the early adopters first. Um, and, and solar panels went to the early adopters, adopters first and foremost. That did not have a regional impact on the areas that were historically disinvested. So now Los Angeles is moving towards this equity lens so that we can ensure that the benefits are not only seen equitably across the city, but that we believe that this is a strategy that will accelerate uh, the diminishment of urban heat islands where they are the worst and where they are the greatest. Um, and we do it strategically so that we're investing smart. We're not just planting trees all over the place. <laughs> we're planting trees where they're most needed and where, where they'll have the largest regional impacts to reduce climate change and, and also mitigate extreme heat in the long run. And I wonder if you can comment on this same question from the perspective of how the Natural Capital Project views a, a sustainable, livable city. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I work for the Natural Capital Project at Stanford, which tries to advance the science, technology, and partnerships that enable people and nature to thrive. So in terms of this question about urban heat, what we think about is urban design with nature-based solutions and how we can address that first part of what Marta was talking about in terms of decreasing the extent of the urban heat island. So um, just in terms of a little bit of context, there are going, we expect there to be 7 billion urban residents by 2030. And many of them are going to be experiencing the kinds of heat that we're experiencing in California these days today. Um, for example, there may be up to uh, 12 or 13 degrees Fahrenheit temperature increases experienced by uh, nearly 2,000 cities by 2050. And we need to get ahead of this in terms of thinking about how to address urban heat. And one of the things that we can, one of the tools at our disposal is thinking about urban, green, and blue spaces. So thinking about how we can add large urban parks, how we can add street trees, how we can think about um, uh, nature-based solutions that are, um, think about the way that air flows in cities, and then also engineering kinds of um, solutions like uh, reflective pavement and reflective roofs, those kinds of things. We can do the economic analysis and we can show that those kinds of solutions can deliver 
net benefits that way outweigh their costs. And if we can get ahead of this, we can also think about, like Marta was talking about these kinds of equity dimensions. We can think about targeting these sorts of solutions to places where communities are most vulnerable for lots of different reasons, most vulnerable to heat, but also socially vulnerable or communities that have been under-resourced in general. And so we can use tools like models, for example, to help us understand where investments in green infrastructure can provide the most benefits equitably to the most people. And, and that kind of thing is the sort of lens that we take when thinking about engaging with communities to think about where investments in nature-based solutions might make the most sense. And I can talk about details of some examples later on if you like, or I can jump into some of those now. Up to you, Chris. Uh, you know, Diane, uh, this experience with climate adaptation where a benefit cost analysis says pretty clearly we, we should be doing more, but it's always tough to find the resources to mobilize communities and cities to make investments that we you know pay off. And it's hard to generate the political will to make the changes that everybody agrees would be a good idea. But can you work with the uh, with the um, Cool Cities Coalition, what does that conversation look like? And how do you argue for transitioning to a more proactive adaptation stance? Sure, well, I want to um, actually key off of what Marta had said, that the approach that um, Los Angeles is taking, I think is spot on because um, in some of the research that I've been involved with, uh, what's been discovered, you. People can tell a lot of this is at the local city level, um, urban heat islands. And oftentimes within cities, you have one department like the transportation or whoever's doing paving has sort of one view of things. And then you have another one, the building folks, and what do they require in terms of um, cool roofs? And then you have another one, the planting department. And so you oftentimes actually have a lot of contradictions about where to spend money. And that's why I want to get back to your question that um, there may be some money, but it has to, in my mind, really be prioritized. And again, I want to give a shout out to Marta talking about accountability matters. And that's one of the areas where um, some of the research and analytical work is coming along um, that these communities need tools that are very sophisticated that really help analyze you know, what is the climate that's going on? Where are the hot spots of urban heat islands? What are the temperatures in which they occur? And then more granular, what do you have in terms of pavement there? What do you have in terms of uh, canopies, um, tree canopies and the roofs? So um, there's behind your question of getting motivated. We have to think about what are the tools, what are our knowledge, are we working together? But I just want to call out that there's some very important work that actually has happened um, under the uh, Department of Energy at the federal level. Their building technology office has funded what's called the National Cool Surface Deployment Plan. And I think we're going to put a link in. It was headed up by um, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is a pioneer in the heat island effect, first started by Dr. Rosenfeld. And this plan, which took two years, um, I was impressed with because it didn't just talk to sort of um, the usual environmental activists, not that we aren't all, that's very important, but it really went across all the stakeholders and it came up with looking at what technology exists, where do we stand on codes and standards and requirements, because stepping back, um, we want to get away from putting in dark roofs everywhere. We want to have white roofs because we've got the technology. It's cost effective. We want to change how we're paving our streets to go to more to lighter colors or permeable. But this plan did a great job of assessing where are we with the codes, standards, programs, literature, et cetera, and came up with 17 recommendations. And I just heard from um, Dr. Levinson at the lab yesterday who um, spearheaded it, that DOE is now funding three important areas. One is going to be technical assistance to governments. And I think, Chris, that will help a lot on the motivation and the political will. 
Usually when there's money coming or technical assistance, it helps. The second is launching a Keep Your Cool national educational program, getting to your part about um, how do we, in the immediate time when we've got heat waves coming, what can we do? And then the third part is going to be high profile demonstration programs, because that again needs to be where people understand a lot of this technology exists. We've had small projects um, that show what happens when a community really digs in deep on um, cool roofs, cool buildings, cool walls, the canopy effect, but getting that word out of what was involved. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that I think nobody likes um, uh, the heat. And when you look at the cities that are active um, in the United States on really trying to address heat, it is not red and it's not blue. It is a combination of both, both political sides. <laughs> The emphasis on things we can do to make surfaces cool is super important, and there's so many opportunities there. Sean, we, you're, a lot of the research you've done in this space is to kind of really push the frontier of how cool we can make cool surfaces. Can you just tell us a little bit about sort of where things are when you look at the spectrum of going from lighter colored pavement and white roofs all the way to these super high tech things you're working on that that cool dramatically. Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, Chris, first of all, thanks for uh, organizing this. I'm uh, already learning a lot listening to my fellow panelists who are uh, not the usual uh, people that I hang out with. So, uh, <laughs> so I certainly uh, We're quite happy to hang out with you too. Yeah. So uh, maybe a brief word about what we do. Uh, uh, my group uh, specializes in photonics, so we work on photonic structures. And uh, in the discussion of uh, global warming uh, in general, and in discussion of urban, e urban heat island, uh, radiated forcing, of course, is very important. And people have uh, uh, done a great amount of work looking at how to control radiation uh, to uh, mitigate many of these effects. So. Uh, there are actually two types of radiations. One of them is the sunlight and the reflection. Uh, whether you reflect, whether you absorb, of course, uh, affect heat balance. Uh, the other one uh, is the thermal radiation, uh, where in fact every one of us give out, and that's an intrinsic heat dissipation mechanism. So uh, much of the thermal balance on the radiative side uh, depends on controlling both of these pathways. Uh, one of the work that we did that Chris uh, alluded to uh, was to try to design materials that are strongly reflective for sunlight uh, so that it doesn't get heat up as much by the sun, uh, but in the meantime generates a very strong thermal radiation that can be radiated into the sky. Uh, so this is a, a step further uh, from the uh, more widely adopted uh, cool roof concept. And what we're able to show is that under direct sunlight, uh, you can actually have these material without any electricity input uh, to reach subambient temperature. Uh, some experiments get to temperature about maybe five or depending on thermal insulation, even higher temperature reduction from the ambient uh, without passive energy, uh, without any electrical uh, electro energy input. And we've been uh, working hard to try to uh, commercialize this, uh, in particular, in trying to reduce the uh, electricity consumption in the air conditioning of the buildings. So that's something, uh, that's one of the examples, I guess, alluded to what Chris is asking on uh, some of the engineering effort that one can do in uh, really uh, trying to control uh, the radiative side of the thermal balance. Um, I would perhaps also briefly mention on many uh, a few other areas uh, where this kind of control uh, can potentially uh, be of importance in this context. Uh, for example, uh, it is uh, in the case of inside the building, if the environment gets heats up, of course, the load that you put on the air conditioning and so on uh, become uh, more and more severe. And uh, one of the things that we pursued, uh, some of the work we have done, for example, in collaboration with Professor E. Trace Group at Stanford, uh, is to uh, try to change the uh, radiated environment inside as well. Uh, for example, to develop uh, uh, paintings on the wall 
that are strongly reflecting for the thermal radiation, therefore to get better insulation of the inside from the outside. And in doing so, reduce the electricity consumption of the building. Uh, and also in uh, recognizing that in many of the air conditioning uh, situation, uh, what you ultimately care about is to improving the comfort of people in the building. Uh, so uh, trying to concentrate the resources in a radiated way to enhance the comfort of the people rather than spending all the electricity to cool down the air inside the building, for example, uh, would also be of interest. So uh, in general, I think there are a lot of uh, uh, important uh, cutting edge science and engineering that's ongoing uh, in trying to control radiation, control both solar uh, side of the radiation and the thermal side of the radiation uh, in order to create uh, technological options uh, for managing many of the uh, heat effect. And I'm uh, certainly very excited also to, uh, uh, to interact and to hear about, uh, certainly we come from uh, doing very uh, scientific skill. Uh, as Chris said, we do nanophotonics. These are very small scale things, uh, but to think about this in a much larger context as well. If I understand correctly, your group has also been incorporating some of these high-tech materials into clothing. Uh, that is right. The yeah. uh, so that uh, connects to uh, what I said about improving the thermal comfort of a person inside the building. If you can enhance the heat dissipation of a person uh, in the building, uh, then uh, you may not need as much uh, uh, air conditioning. And that was the uh, one of the ideas that we've been pursuing on uh, developing textiles that have better heat dissipation from the body to the ambient environment. Chris, you know, could, I, uh, could I follow go up? Go ahead, Diane. Um, I just want to emphasize to all of the folks who are listening what a huge point um, uh, you, we just heard from Shen Wei which is um, every study we know of says that if the solution to the heating of the world is we're gonna put air conditioning in every building, that is a path for disaster. Um, with our air conditioning, they help the building and its occupants, but they are not helping on addressing climate change. And that's what I wanted to make sure to understand the linkage with the hydrofluorocarbons, um, uh, from air conditioning, the use of the electricity of the air conditioning, which that electricity is still, for the most part around the world, um, fossil fired. So that's why these steps to th think about is going to be the solution to urban heat islands and rising temperatures beyond the tool of air conditions. Air conditioning is so absolutely critical. So um, I just wanted to make sure we emphasize that this is not, you know, just purely wonderful academic research. This is what the world's going to need to avoid having this sort of doom cycle of heat, air conditioning, worse global warming. And, um, and when you talk about nature-based solutions, you're talking about not only uh, things to make lighter, but building in trees and water bodies that add evaporative cooling. Do you want to say more about the kind of the, the, how nature can help us? <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's certainly not a silver bullet, but um, as one piece of a portfolio of solutions for addressing multiple urban challenges, nature can really help. So for example, Thinking about adding green spaces to cities, you don't only improve urban cooling, but you also are beginning to mitigate climate by storing carbon. You're offering opportunities for recreation. You're improving physical health and mental health of urban residents because you're providing opportunities for people to get outdoors. Um, we did some work with um, the Food Policy Council in San Antonio, mm -hmm. where we explored opportunities for investing in urban agriculture. And in this case, uh, those green spaces are not only providing those benefits that I just mentioned, but also food. Um, so we looked at food forests and urban 
um, agriculture, urban farms. And we explored using the kinds of modeling tools that I mentioned before, we were able to calculate the amount of food provided as well as quantify all or many of those other benefits that I mentioned so that we can start to get at that siloed urban decision-making problem mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. Diane was talking about in terms of finding new kinds of resources to invest in nature-based solutions in cities. So for example, um, we presented our work in San Antonio to the city council and they are now investing in, based on our report, the, we wrote a report called Vibrant Lands, the, let's see if I can figure out where to put this. <laughs> it's, no, it's, 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 it's in the, it's it's in the okay. chat. Yeah, we're, we're <laughs> um, ahead of you. But the, uh, the, the, we, we presented the report to the city council and they are now investing in urban agriculture in three different places in the city. And it's expected that some of the city's $825,000 that's allocated for community resilience from their resilience, energy efficiency and sustainability fund will be spent on food forests. So if we can help various decision makers across a city and community members advocate for themselves, I think that we can change the way we think about cities to bring nature in to address multiple problems at once mm -hmm. and find ways to break down some of those silos in urban decision making where the Department of Transportation doesn't talk to the Department of Health and doesn't talk to the folks who are responsible for dealing with floods, et cetera. Because it is one system, and if we can start thinking about it that way, and I think that uh, nature-based solutions can be one entry point to getting people to talk across silos. Yeah. Marnie, you started out by emphasizing the importance of community engagement as a part of the overall strategy. And, and when you invest in community engagement, engagement in Los Angeles. What do you hear? What do people want? And how do you find that aligns with the things that as the chief heat officer, you're able to provide? Yeah, I, I think that one of the main things we hear is, you know, that they have, since they have excess emergency room visits and excess premature deaths, um, there's a higher level of discomfort from from extreme heat and heat waves in those communities because those are the communities that tend to lack air conditioning. So they definitely want more thermal comfort. And in fact, there's quite a few council motions right now asking various departments to consider how we add equipment to apartments um, because right now landlords in Los Angeles are not required to add air conditioning. They're required to keep the apartments uh, warm enough during the winter, but not cool enough during the summer because we've always had a temperate climate. So that's one of the things we hear more, the discomfort of being an outdoor worker and then coming home to an even hotter home um, and never getting the opportunity for your body to recover from that extreme heat. We also hear things like open up the pools um, and splash pads for free. Don't charge us $3, $2 or $1. It's something that the city should provide. Um, for thermal cooling for our low-income communities that can't afford to take two or three of their kids all at once to a pool. So we we actually did a survey with UCLA, and I'd be happy to share it with you after this. Um, and the one of the main things that we we definitely heard is please make sure that we have more resilience centers and cooling centers in our community. And what we've done since then is convey that all of our libraries, all of our public facilities, all of our rec centers, our cooling centers, our resilience centers. If you need shade, if you need water, if you need respite from the heat waves, please use our public facilities. But I also wanted to take an opportunity to echo Anne and Diane about how we need multiple solutions. It's an interdisciplinary approach. We definitely want nature-based solutions in these low-income communities because when you compare a low-income community in an urban heat island to one in West Los Angeles where they have 
urban forests and many parks, open space. The, the big difference is nature. And, and nature also reduces the energy burden of those apartments and of those homes in West Los Angeles. So they also have reduced costs for energy consumption in the West Side than they do in a low income community that lacks shade infrastructure and lacks shade equity. So definitely these low income communities want more trees, they want more vegetation, they want more bus shelters, they want more hydration stations. And that's exactly what we're working on with this concept of targeting heat resilient zones in the areas of highest risk. Um, and then we realizing that maintenance for trees is a huge issue. You could plant a beautiful tree, but if there's no maintenance funds, unfortunately, those trees will not survive or thrive. So we wanna push for maintenance to be part of the infrastructure budget. It's always about the maintenance, right? Um, so those are a few things I think that come out of the community and they wanna be involved in the decision-making and in Los Angeles, I'm also the executive director for the Climate Emergency Mobilization Commission that's representative of all of these communities. And they are an additional voice of advocacy within the city council to advise them on the solutions that communities want. So we create reports that emanate from community dialogues, push them through the commission, and they go directly to the council and advise the council on the solutions that these communities need. Excellent. Thanks so much. Let me ask one more question of Diane before we go to questions from the audience. We've 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 talked mainly about uh, addressing the crisis of urban heat islands, but you come from a perspective of of decreasing energy use where we can, and certainly decreasing emissions. And I wonder if you could just close us off with a couple of comments about ways that we can advance an energy efficiency agenda in a way that's complementary to the um, reducing urban heat islands agenda? Sure. Um, two points real quickly. Um, there have been very important studies done about in a building, if it has a dark roof, I, it's, it's like dark roofs, get rid of dark roofs will be a whole lot better. But if it has a dark roof, the air conditioning use on the top floors is very large because the heat is absorbed. That's our problem with dark roofs. It's absorbing. And that heat is actually going into the building. When you switch over to a white roof, you may decrease the air conditioning load on those top floors by 10, 20%. And that then means less stress on our electric grid and less um, cost to people running those air conditions. So this is an area where there is an incredibly tight linkage um, between what's happening on the energy side, what's happening on the cost side, the comfort side, but the climate side. The other part that I'll say is we haven't mentioned is I, I brought up air conditioners, but heat pumps. Um, heat pumps have a misnomer because they say heating. Well, heat pumps cool as well. Um, and so they sort of get confused in the dialogue of if you're saying air conditioning, are you talking a traditional air conditioner that has um, pretty significant adverse climate day impacts, or are you talking a cooling through mechanical means of a heat pump? And the great advantage of the heat pump is one, it's using a lot less um, electricity, it's much more efficient, but you take out your furnace, fossil fired, your gas furnace usually, um, and you are then in the winter time using the electric heat as well. And so, and that obviously has um, impacts on climate. There's a lot of work going on about how we're gonna be restructuring our electric rates because as we move to an area of sort of a policy approach where um, heat pumps are good for the environment, they're good for efficiency, they're good for a lot of reasons, but they mean a lot of stress potentially on our electric system. And that's why uh, these answers aren't simple, really, because there's such major changes. But as a policymaker, former policymaker, it's not necessarily the technology that holds us back. It's really getting good facts, good understanding, and then making a rapid enough shift in terms of what our rules are on rates or other areas. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's that's terrific. And I, I do want to turn now to audience questions, but I 
I love this perspective that there are things we can do with technology, things we can do with community, and we need to find a way to make those work together. Um, I'm going to start with a, a technology question. This one is for Sean Wee. Uh, Dr. Fon, the, the, for the textiles work, do you have any sense of how these new fabrics might affect water quality? As a runner, I often feel bad for using performance fabrics because of the way they shed microfibers during repeated washings. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, a lot of work in these kind of developing new textiles goes into uh, enhancing or rather uh, at least preserving most of the uh, traditional textiles uh, uh, comfort uh, consideration. For example, wickability, uh, water evaporation, perspiration, evaporation, all these aspects. So uh, a lot of work goes into trying to engineer uh, the radiator properties of it, as I talked about, but in the meantime, uh, preserving or even enhancing some of the more traditional considerations uh, for these textiles as well. Uh, and uh, uh, these textiles, some of them uh, require, for example, a certain structural uh, modification of the fiber inside the textile. And so, uh, uh, and a lot of work also go into uh, trying to work out the long-term durability uh, of these kind of textiles as well. I saw there was another question asking if you could buy any of these textiles yet. I assume they're pre-commercial? Uh, some people are trying, but I think it's okay. pre-commercial. Well, yeah. Good Good luck with that. Let, let me um, let me turn to a question from Marta. This one's from Rosario Sargues. Um, some of the strategies to mitigate climate change begin with education of the community, environment, and domestic education for the conservation of local natural capital. Uh, do, do you think about urban family backyard spaces when you lay out your broad education strategies? Do I? Personally, yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> is the city uh, thinking about that at the moment? I think most cities are thinking about the housing crisis and the unhoused and adding ADUs to uh, single family homes. So there is a tension between addressing critical crises like the unhoused and increasing open space and permeable land for, for not just for transpiration and cooling, but also for the um, enjoyment of, of individuals. And there's so many other co-benefits to that. So I guess my, I think the answer to that is uh, there's some very innovative thinking that I'm sure that Anne can contribute here. Um, but it's not in the code. It's not a part of the, the community plan. It's not something that's being uh, pushed or there's no initiative to do so on behalf of the city of LA. We have other great initiatives for biodiversity, for composting, for um, reducing green waste uh, and greenhouse gas emissions. But that is something that we definitely need to add to the agenda. And there is... Um tremendous tension between addressing the housing availability crisis and the um, urban heat island crisis. How in the Natural Capital Project have you thought about addressing that tension? Yeah, it's a really thorny issue. Um, one of the ways in which we've begun to wrestle with that is to help so we often work closely with leaders within a city to think about what are the relevant questions to ask. And then we help by creating what we call scenarios. So for example, some of our team was working with um, a group that was trying to decide what to do with a golf course that was being decommissioned. And then the question was, would it make sense for the golf course to become affordable housing? What about um, a, a urban um, industrial area? What, what about a large park? And what we were able to do is to help the leaders in that community see what might the likely ramifications of such land use change be. So we could look at the, um, water storage capacity, all those other benefits that I mentioned before and compare what are the different benefits that you get out of each of those scenarios. 
we're not modeling sort of human well-being. Ultimately, we can't say this is the answer. This is the way to balance all of these different things, but we can help quantify some of the benefits provided by different solutions in order to provide that information to communities who can then make more informed decisions about how to balance questions like where to invest in housing versus more green space by trying to put together metrics that give us a sense of what are the multiple different things that might be provided by any one land use type. Perfect. We're going to have time for about two more questions. I want to ask one. I'll start with Diane. This is from my faculty colleague, Marshall Burke. And he says, and related to Chris's earlier question, what do you see as the main barriers to the adoption of some of these promising approaches? Do people just not know about them or the benefits? Are they too expensive? Um, well, the uh, DOE National uh, Cool Services Deployment Plan that I uh, mentioned, uh, we put the link in, it goes through barriers. So it actually is good news. We've just had a recent really good look at this. And as in all these issues, it's a multiple of things. Um, one of the interesting things is for cool roofs, um, it's considered sort of, aren't we doing it? It's not sexy, people said. People would much rather think about, you know, solar panels or battery, whereas putting, you know, the pro proper reflective paint on your roof just doesn't engage people at quite the right level. Or people think the problem's taken care of. But um, we need to vastly step up our efforts to get um, cool roofs and um, cool walls into building codes so that when you're putting up a building, you're not adding to the problem, you're being part of the solution in this area. And I think, um, again, what the studies have found is people just assume, well, of course that's happening, but there's less than 10 states across the country that really have good efforts in this area. Um, the other thing is cost or a perception of cost. The good news in the area I work with, um, which is the cool um, materials, cooling materials, the cost has come down. And in many times, it is not more costly to put on a cool roof reflection um, material versus, um, you know, the straight old dark roof. But the perception is, oh, my gosh, this is costly. So it's just a multitude of different barriers, but that's why I'm excited. The level of interest now, because unfortunately we have, you know, extreme temperatures is huge to say, where are these solutions? And because it's not quite technology in all cases, um, I think we are starting to make a lot more progress to address the barriers. Terrific. And, and Martin, I wonder if you'd like to come in. I'm, a, I'm especially interested in how you think about the sort of comparative value of uh, command and control regulatory approaches to requiring cool roofs and white pavement to public education and more of a, a soft approach to improving the physical characteristics and the environmental characteristics of a city like Los Angeles. Well, I think it's going to take a, a multifaceted approach um, and how I meant what I mentioned earlier, a system of accountability that is centralized through um, not only the equity index uh, and our budget, uh, but also through alignment of all of our plans and our investments. So currently we have a climate, a capital climate infrastructure director in the city administrative office. We also have um, that equity index that's being further developed in the city administrative office. And CMO and other departments are working closely with them to create reasonable, feasible, realistic climate equity goals so that when we report on a yearly basis um, to uh, the city council and the mayor and the public what we've invested in um, and where we've invested, uh, there is a way to measure that success and a way to understand where we have um, made some failures and, and course correct. So that, that's a system of accountability that's in the process of being uh, developed and improved, but we've already been using it for the last couple of years. Uh, but I, I really do think that implementation um, and key performance indicators need to be a bigger part of every 
department and every office that is investing in climate infrastructure or or services, uh, public awareness campaigns, emergency management, um, disaster preparedness. And the other thing is overlapping climate adaptation and climate mitigation with emergency response, like resilience centers and cooling centers and hydration stations, et cetera, so that um, there, for the public, it's a seamless uh, service and solution and investment, and they just get the benefits of all of those changes and transformations. Excellent. I, I love the juxtaposition of the accountability framework with the really concrete things that can be done. Uh, let me close out with one final question for Anne. We've talked a lot about things that could be done in, in U.S. cities and the really proactive, effective steps that are being taken in places like Los Angeles. Uh, but there are many, many cities uh, around the world that, that don't have access to the kind of financial resources and that we we have in the U.S. Are there, are there special things to think about for cities in the in the global South that can make a difference for urban heat islands? I think that it's really no. There are not necessarily special things to consider. I think it's more a question of recognizing that nature-based solutions are. Um, they can be relatively affordable and that they're not a luxury, that they're, they're important for cities globally to be able to provide not only relief from heat, but also all of those other benefits that I've mentioned before, and that people in cities all over the world need those benefits. And so it really is kind of the, the, the same message um for uh cities in the global south as it is for those in the global north yeah can i add something to that uh chris i sure. i guess i want to say that in, in the global south and in other developing areas of the world where um corporate agriculture has entered the scene a lot of our climate immigrants across the globe and there are millions and there will be more are being affected because their water rights have been impeded, taken away. Um, and that and that's just one very direct way that the global South has been impacted. And then if we think about islands like Guam and Puerto Rico, Hawaii now, <laughs> even though it's part of the United States, we have an opportunity there to use um, renewable energy as the main uh, source of energy because they are independent uh, pockets of land across the globe. And we haven't done that efficiently. I heard a webinar the other day of Puerto Rico and how um, their public utility had an opportunity to uh, go all solar or go all renewable, but instead a corporation was brought in to manage the public utility and it hasn't taken advantage of this once in a lifetime opportunity to create a public utility that is run by renewable energy. And, and I, I just want to emphasize that this conversation has brought together a really impressive array of solutions that we can use to tackle the urban heat island effect, both through technology and through community engagement. But underscoring all of this is the point that Marta closes with, which is that we have to limit the amount of climate change that occurs if any of these things are going to be successful in the long run. Let me thank all the panelists for a wonderful conversation. Thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us today. And as always, thanks to the Superb Woods Institute staff, Lee Rosenbaum, Kamaya Daniels, Molly Field, Roberta Tugendreich, Celia Daniels, and Christine Black. We look forward to seeing you next time.